the, the end of history moment um, in many ways created a delusion that the hegemon was actually all powerful and would always be all powerful. And uh, but the reality is, is that history didn't end at all. I mean, it barely rested. We we see this not only in the technological realm. We it's also the way that in like recently in the last. 15, 20 years, the US and Europe, in my view, have been actually tearing down quite a bit of the inf the, the uh, global infrastructure that they've been building. And I don't mean necessarily hardware, I mean the software also with the, a wonderful example for me is the World Trade Organization, which is the end point of a long development out of GATT and so on that, that, that really set the rules of the game of trade, which were skewed towards be, being beneficial for the US and Europe. And the moment the, the, the WTO actually became quite international and other states started using it to, to drag the US to court and say like, hey, you need to give us access to your markets as well and so on and so forth. The U.S. kind of checkmated the WTO by not appointing a judge to the appellate court. Therefore, the whole dispute resolution mechanism, which is a smart one, it's a good resolution mechanism, um, is 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 not working anymore. And that this thing was part of the of the infrastructure that the U.S. used to provide, and now does not anymore. And what we see is that that alternative approaches at then structuring trade is coming in, and the uh, China has alternative approaches of of um, developing its its manufacturing capacity, and that then ultimately weakens the the power of the hegemon, who, whose power used to be that it provides these public goods, right? Everybody gets to profit, therefore, and you you control the platform, therefore, you have outsized weight. Um, something that Ben Norton talks about is that China has is the only other country apart from the U.S. that has technological sovereignty. Is this something that that you would also agree with that China is able to have its own its own WeChat, basically its own Twitter, its own platforms? And that that changes the equation for, you know, the way that the state uh, can interact with society and with its economy. Oh, absolutely. Look, technical sovereignty, um, I think, look, whether it was by planning, good design or a little bit of good fortune and probably a combination of all of that has enabled China to um, protect itself from uh, from things that it believes are not good for it. Um, and what it's also done is signalled the capacity of nation states to, um, in, in the technical realm, to pursue a more sovereign path. So uh, I, I've described it in some of the essays that I've written as the emergence of a form of technical Westphalia or a digital Westphalia, uh, which, uh, which for the time being, remains something that very few countries can do. But I think going back to the earlier observations about the open source technologies and those sorts of things um, is something that will increasingly become within reach of countries around the world. And again, a bit like the WTO and those sorts of things you mentioned, there has been uh, an, uh, an, an autoimmunity reaction that has actually corroded the foundations of the hegemon and these autoimmune reactions have actually been instigated by the hegemon themselves um, which is is in many ways counterintuitive but uh, but speaks to i guess uh, an embedded belief that uh, the hegemonic position enables them to dictate all terms forever and the world doesn't work that way today if ever, right? You know, so the, the end of history moment um, in many ways created a delusion that the hegemon was actually all powerful and would always be all powerful. And, uh, but the reality is, is that history didn't end at all. I mean, it barely rested and it continued to evolve as nations pursued their development. And we are now at a point where the technical capabilities for nations to pursue technical sovereignty, to pursue digital Westphalia as an operating system globally, 
will challenge the foundations of American big tech, and it's already challenging the technical and institutional foundations of the US dollar denominated and dominated global trade and finance system. Where do you see BRICS uh, in this, in all of these equations? The, because this is a new, I mean, BRICS has been around for a long time, but recently it has gathered so much speed and there's there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of a, uh, a lot of like showing of these states that they belong together and that they want to do trade together, but yet they, they are not moving toward being an, a military alliance far away from it. They are far away from 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 integrating in any way that, like, let's say, the European states have integrated far away from that. Right? It's a com it's a different model. It's more of a a counter a counterweight to the G seven, let's say, a very loose uh, alliance. Where do you see it in 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 this new game? Look, I think it has a few dimensions, Pascal. One of the dimensions, of course, is the sheer heft. Collectively, the expanded BRICS BRICS plus brings to the table significant productive capacity globally, as well as uh, access to important natural resources, whether they're mineral resources or hydrocarbon-based energy resources. So these are very significant foundation stones for being able to implement um, a, an international system with a hyphen in between, if you will, which is really about um, acknowledging that nation states are sovereign, that relationships between them need to be based on mutual benefit, and that to ensure that, um, they need to be able to bring real economy resources to the table. So I think that that's the first layer, is that there is significant economic heft based on real economy capabilities. The second thing that's interesting about BRICS is that it also has, because it has economic heft, the ability now to develop a payment system that is distinct from the SWIFT-based, US dollar-based post Bretton Woods payment system. Now, this matters increasingly because we have seen, and this is another autoimmunity um, symptom, the weaponization of the US dollar and the weaponization of the US dollar-based payment system, so much so that holding reserves in US dollars or US dollar denominated assets or even Euro denominated assets has now become a risk. And it's a risk because they're exposed to capricious censorship and confiscation. Uh, so, Last weekend. Uh, th th this is again um, a, a, a self-destructive autoimmune reaction to the situation in Russia and Ukraine, the idea that you you, you can capriciously um, confiscate assets actually says to everyone else who holds assets denominated in those currencies that there are significant risks. So that's the second layer of BRICS, that it brings that um, momentum to the table around currency multipolarity. The third thing that BRICS, I think, brings to the table is actually... Um, an operating ethos. So the operating ethos, which has been in some ways criticised by those who want to paint BRICS as a disorganised, um, incoherent rabble, that's actually its strength, is that it isn't something driven by the idea of a single overarching hegemonic proposition um, where there's a, a, a sort of a a behind the scenes Leviathan, in a sense, providing the, the, the security of last resort to them all. What the operating ethos of BRICS is, is one that actually acknowledges a distributed set of power relationships that requires these nations to engage with each other, not with the expectation that there's a le Leviathan somewhere sitting in the background, but with the fact that they've just got to deal with each other on their own terms and on their own merits and with a view to their mutual interest. The other element of BRICS, which I should mention, which is really part of that layer two, is the emergence of the BRICS Bank, the New Development Bank. Mm. And the New Development Bank is relatively new, number one, but importantly, it has started to raise capital 
in national currencies through the issuance of bonds that will enable the provision of finance to member states in national currencies. And that matters more and more against a backdrop where not only do we have the weaponization of the US dollar denominated world, but where holding debts denominated in US dollars exposes you to not only exchange rate risk problems, but also the risk that American domestic monetary policy is going to cause you significant damage because as interest rates go up in the US, your, re your, your, your debt repayment costs also rise putting extra pressures on your domestic economy. So BRICS is actually a really important piece of the transformation jigsaw puzzle. Some people will go so far as to say that BRICS is offering an alternative narrative to the United Nations in that BRICS is functional, whereas the United Nations in different respects has demonstrated that it is far less functional than many had hoped when it was first created. I'm not sure I would go quite that far yet. You know, BRICS is 11 countries. The United Nations has 70 years of history, 190 plus countries. It's a different ball game, but I think the idea of functional operating DNA amongst countries that BRICS brings to the table is something that the UN could do with as well. Yeah, and the UN is because the way it is structured with the charter and the way it is set up is going to be very, in my view, impossible to ever bring to move to that way because it's just it's it, it's deadlocked itself. But BRICS, by virtue of of being a, a relatively recent and and gene um, natural kind of phenomenon, right? It's a natural way that these that these countries get together and they they get gather more momentum. That changes quite a bit. And I think also what you said is is very important also to keep in mind the this idea that within BRICS we can still have conflict, but we will we will not cease cooperation. China and India. They have border disputes. They have very, very strong disputes, but they manage them and they still cooperate. It's also it was a smart move to extend BRICS to Iran and Saudi Arabia to say, like, you know, we work with we can be rivals and partners at the same time and meet and then move at different speeds. That's a very different operating system from the idea of the G7 and so on of only playing with your own friends. And keep make sure that your friends actually actually um, stick together. Um, I was the one thing I'm wondering is the the we we go we're going away from the dollar definitely that's no question. But having a one single reserve currency or one single currency to go back to uh, does provide a lot of benefits, which is why everybody used the dollars. It's not just that the US imposed it through the petrodollar and so on. It's also that it was it's convenient as a unit of account and as a as 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 a as a medium way also for other countries to to exchange. So if we suppose that we go toward a world where the US dollar is just one among many many what how would you think that the actual payment systems and debt settling mechanisms will work is it going to be a different currency or will we move to a different model of maybe a, a entire basket of currencies in which countries then can get indebted in what what's the most likely scenario to you look i think we've, in a sense let's take half a step back and understand um the functions of these currencies in 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 a system of cross border trade as a reserve currency and, a, and, and as a means of cross-border payments, um, a currency, in effect, fulfills the role of a numeraire. So the exchange between two parties, by definition, is an exchange of equivalence. So you're exchanging two quite different things, and yet you've got to have some way of coming to a view that you are exchanging equivalence. So a numeraire performs that role. Anything can be a numeraire so long as the parties agree to it. A numeraire needs to be stable or relatively stable because you need to have confidence that you can continue to conduct these transactions or exchanges of equivalence through time um, uh, on the basis of roughly similar equivalents, you know, 
from today and tomorrow and in a year's time. So the US dollar as a, um, as a numeraire has been quite useful in many regards. Now, when the US dollar first became the, the dominant currency in the years immediately after the Second World War, the discussions at Bretton Woods that made that possible or gave rise to that actually saw a very interesting debate take place between the British and the American economists involved in those negotiations. And uh, and so on the American side was a guy called White and on the, the British side was a guy called Keynes. And Keynes actually proposed what was in effect um, a non-national currency, the Bancor, that would function as the numeraire against which all national currencies would be uh, would be adjusted to, and that the trade would take place really through a clearinghouse in which na- nations or central banks of nations would have accounts in which bank cores would be adjusted. Now, the mechanism that Keynes proposed would have seen countries with surpluses of bank cores compelled to invest in debt or countries to facilitate the, re, the, the, the re-establishment of balance within the global system. Now, Keynes's proposal didn't succeed. The US at the time had many good reasons why it would have preferred and wanted the US dollar to be the predominant numeraire within a global trading system. And that's exactly what ended up happening. It was, as you'll know, the last and only standing manufacturing powerhouse in the world after the Second World War. Um, And so for many years, it actually ran significant trade surpluses. Uh, So it it made a lot of sense for the Americans at the time to prefer a system anchored by the United States dollar as system numeraire. But there was, at the time, serious thinking about alternatives. Now, the digitalization of information flows and accounts in ledgers actually makes it possible, I think, to uh, imagine a digitalized numeraire um, to fulfill those sorts of functions. And perhaps they're the sorts of things that the BRICS countries are now going through uh, during the course of 2024 as a BRICS national currency-based payment system is being designed and worked through by the finance ministers of BRICS. I don't know what the end outcome is going to be, but in terms of uh, a likely short-term eventuality, I doubt that any one currency will replace the US dollar. That's the first point to make. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot of reasons for that, Pascal. One is that the system transformations that are taking place are actually not about replacing one economic hegemon with another economic hegemon. Yeah. But it's a transformation yeah. of an economic system that is becoming more decentered. And the centering of the global economic networks will, by definition, mean the emergence and use of multiple national currencies. Yeah, but that 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 also has like significant costs and and comes with problems because if you settle all cross border trade in your in your local currencies, you you naturally everybody has to hold the currencies of everybody else, and that's a mess, and that will probably give an impetus to to change to something, and in in the meantime probably keep the U.S. dollar at least at least to a good bit around. So my question is like, where are we going to move to next, or are we going to go? Are we going to be able to technologically? Um, manage the holding of so many currencies among each other, well, this, which we wouldn't have seen so far. This is the, that would be new. This is the beauty of digitalization, is that digitalization enables um, the resolution of many of these transaction cost problems literally on digital ledgers. Um, so again, it goes back to the issue of what functions as a numeraire, right? And how yeah, but... numeraire is held as a way of balancing the value flows between different economies. I think that yeah. many of the design issues were addressed 70 years ago, broadly speaking, and with a technology gloss, so to speak, 
I think we are able to move towards a technically enabled decentralized national currency based trading system. Um, now, what then fulfills the role of numeraire and what anchors that numeraire and what the adjustment mechanisms are that will enable national currencies to numeraire ratios to adjust through time. Well, that's going to be something that will be subject to, I think, um, considerable um, intellectual effort and negotiation and compromise in due course. Yeah, you know, the, the question that is on my mind is what in the discussion that we have is actually going to be genuinely new in terms of what technology can provide be, uh, and what is an old problem in a new in a new garment? Because it's quite in, it's really interesting. Digital money is not new. Like I, my research on the Second World War, when Switzerland was in Japan and, you know, had its embassies open, it cleared a lot of accounts between between different belligerents. And it did that all digitally, but via telegraph. Yeah. So the only thing, you know, as you have ledgers and then you have a means of, of, of communication and then you can, can start to clearing. So this is an old technology, actually, digital money. It's not a new one. The question then is like, is, is, is the technology going to transform the underlying uh, the underlying principles, or do we just need a new way of doing something that we've been doing for the last 200 years already? Anyway? Well, a little bit of both, I think, Pascal. And I think you touched on a really important point, you know, with the experience of the Japanese clearinghouse through Telegram, right? Um, because at the end of the day, these are just information systems, you know, literally yeah. dealing with information systems. Traditionally, two sides transacting with each other maintain their own ledger. There was a third party ledger, which in a sense tried to keep records to to match. This was a double entry um, bookkeeping issue. Now, the, the developments in technology, I think, are seeing some movements that will um, address a few issues around how these ledgers are maintained in ways that support one national currency is becoming more significant, um, but also create uh, operating ecosystems that are less risky for national currency or for national for nations and their national currencies. So the idea of a third party being able to capriciously and unilaterally censor or or confiscate um, currencies or their assets can be mitigated when the ledger that accounts for all of these things is actually maintained collectively, right? So. A yeah, the, just a blockchain idea. A blockchain or a distributed ledger of some sort. And we've actually got a number of projects globally that are doing these things already. So Embridge is a project that has been working on cross-border payments uh, with digital currencies anchored by a network of central banks that maintain the ledger collectively. Um, and these are the central banks of China, Thailand, the UAE, um, Hong Kong Monetary Authority with partnerships from the um, International uh, Bank of Settlements, Bank of International Settlements. So mm. Embridge is an interesting project because it shows how the distributed operations of a ledger technology can deal with a range of these issues, both from a cost point of view and also from a risk mitigation point of view. The other interesting thing about digitalization is that it does also enable... Uh, the programming of things to speed up the the ways in which information triggers downstream events um, and to conditionalize those downstream events. Now, when people buy and sell things, intrinsically they're buying and selling not just the things themselves, but information about the things. If you're not satisfied about the information about the thing that you're buying, then you're unlikely to conclude the transaction, right? So you do due diligence because you're finding information out about whatever it is that you're buying. And even in basic transactions where you're dealing in, say, containers of, of foodstuffs, for example, a, a basic piece of information is the tonnage um, and that the, the contents actually meet the specifications that you've had and those sorts of things. Now, payments only happen when those information conditions are met. Digitalization can speed that up. It can speed verification up and it can speed the downstream action up. So instead of the fund sitting still for two, three, four, five, or even 10 days awaiting information to be satisfied and then the messages to be sent for funds to be cleared, 
We can now do this in seconds or milliseconds. Now, this has system-wide implications because it means that there is actually less need for working capital within an overall economic system sitting idle, right? Mm. Money sitting idle is only idle whilst the information about goods and services isn't moving or isn't being resolved. So we're then able to, to pre-program stuff. So the idea of programmability then becomes a significant additional thing, which is easier to do in a digitalized environment than in the days when trade was being done through envelopes of trade documentation, documentary letters of credit and those sorts of things. So there is some qualitative transformation that is happening by virtue of digitalization, but the foundational piece is actually um, a variation on very old themes, which is maintaining ledgers. It's going to be interesting to see how this moves and whether we see comebacks of institutions like the bank, the bank, the bank for international settlement, the BIS, which I think could have a, uh, something to do with this in the future. Even more, you touched on it, but we are nearing the end. So, um, uh, Warwick, uh, is there anything that you want to well, add? Let me just say one last thing, Pascal, and this goes to the issue mm -hmm. of the transformation or the or the migration from a dollar anchored system to something else. It's hard to think about how fast something can change unless we have a reference point. And the most recent and interesting reference point of scale to me is what's happened in relation to Russia in the last two years. In the last two years, Russia has moved from a trading system that was anchored by the US dollar and by the euro to a greater extent to one where over 90% of its trade settlements now are done in anything but US dollars in Euro. Russia is not a small economy. Its global trade interactions is not trivial. Therefore, the Russian experience says to us, and this is putting aside any normative and moral judgments and all those sorts of things, it simply says to us that a transition to a non-USD anchored trade settlement system can happen faster than we think. The same has happened with the RMB, where the RMB now is used to facilitate or to settle over 50% of China's trade. Think about that. 30 years ago, the RMB settled about 5%. Today, it's settling a little bit over 50%. China is the world's biggest trading economy in the world. So, the transition to something other than a USD denominated ecosystem is happening. It happens quicker than we often think. And the case of Russia tells us how quick in theory, when the need exists for that change to happen. Exactly what went through my mind when uh, after Janet Yellen, it was Mr. Lavrov who went to China. It's like, okay, uh, you really need to be, this this is a huge negotiation and change can come rapidly. Um, Warwick Powell, thank you very much for your time today. Absolute pleasure, Pascal.